I want to know, when did the writing bug bite you? Um, yeah, okay, so, you know, when you're, when you're growing up, you're watching stuff. Right. It may sound crazy, but you don't even realize that there are writers. You know, we're the unsung heroes, you know. Right. So it's like I, I went on the set of Hollywood Shuffle, which I'll get into. Mm. But the very first time I, I was on set, uh, I got handed a script for Hollywood Shuffle. And I read the script from cover to cover, first time I'd ever read a, uh, uh, read a script. And I was blown away. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. Who, so you wrote this? Mm. It was like, yeah, yeah, I wrote this. And I was like, ah, uh, that's what I want to do. How old were you? I was 19. Wow. I was 19. Wow. Yeah. That, that was the moment yep. where you thought to yourself, hmm. Well, I mean, I still didn't know what that was. I didn't know how to get into it. Mm. I didn't know that it was a real occupation. Um, you know, I had seen, I'd heard about writers. I remember the character Preach on the show, on the movie uh, Cooley High. And yeah, he was a yeah, writer. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, that sounds cool. A writer. That's, a, <laughs> that, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting about you. you. You're from L.A., is that right? I'm from L.A. The way I always say it is, I was born in the Bay, raised in L.A. There you go. Yeah. And I, yeah. Think, I, I think people underestimate the power of place. Yeah. I think people don't realize how much where you are affects how, what you see. No question. And, and, and one of the things I, I, I was I'm looking forward to asking you, because I'm not from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm originally from New York, mm -hmm. born and raised in New York, right? Mm -hmm. Got a New Yorker. Got some New Yorkers here? <laughs> I love y'all so much. Um, <laughs> um, but being from New York means I see the world a particular way. Sure. And I view people a particular way. Having not grown up here, how does being raised in L.A., affect how you see the world and how you view people? Um, L.A. is a, it's a character of its, of its own, of mm. itself. It, uh, growing up here, that's, no, it really is. Rich. It really is. It's, it's a character by, by itself. Growing up in L.A. was the perfect storm for me. Uh, not just because of the business, but just being here. Um, you know, it's, it's lights, camera, action. We know that from the Hollywood scene, but it was just regular, just a regular place growing up. And where I grew up, it was just, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was just like the perfect storm. I had the perfect childhood. I can't really complain about any of that. Um, what I saw growing up was uh, professional parents, professional father. Because you grew up in what's called the Black Beverly Hills? Well, they calling it that. Okay. They calling it the Black Beverly Hills. Well, I grew up, it's Windsor Hills okay. is where I grew up. I went to Windsor Hills Elementary School. It's View Park. So it's a trifecta. So you got Windsor Hills, View Park. You got Ladera Heights and Baldwin Hills. They say that's the Black Beverly Hills. They got signs up now on Sloss, and I'm going, hey, what is that? New Black Beverly Hills, what is, <laughs> what's this, right? But they, they say that because it's supposedly the richest African-American uh, uh, neighborhood in America, uh, as far as, it, you know, really? as, when it comes to being affluent uh, working, working people. And so I guess it got that moniker as being the Black Beverly Hills, and we rolling with it, we'll roll with that. <laughs> we'll take it. You'll it was cool. It. No, you know, yeah. and, and I think, you know, coming up, you had, um, you know, when I grew up, two blocks over was Ray Charles. Uh, up the street was Ike and Tina Turner. Um, and I grew up with their kids. I grew up with uh, Jim Gilliam's kids, who was, was a Dodger. Um, wow. So many of them. And it was just, but it was just natural, normal for us. It was like judges and doctors. And so I guess that's why I got the, the title, The Black Beverly Hills. So, so that's interesting because... Looking back on it, mm -hmm. how do you think growing up in that environment affected you and your worldview? It affected me. I mean, it had a, a major effect on my uh, on my upbringing, on my uh, my perspective, and everything. Because, like I said, I saw um, upwardly mobile black people hmm. moving and doing things, moving and shaking. You know, I hear the stories about you know a lot of people and friends of mine, you know, that have grown up in in uh, poverty situations. I didn't. Mm. I don't have that story. I I I can't make that. Up. I don't have it right, because I right. saw, you know, movers and shakers, and uh, I went to school with a lot of rich kids and stuff like that. We weren't rich, but we were, you know, guilt by association. We were rolling <laughs> with. Them. And um, but but you know, we had a great a great upbringing. My father was a very professional man, and I saw a guy to get up in the morning and go out there and make it happen. And it just influenced me. Now, growing up, you know, being in L.A., again, 
you know, it's, it's the land of opportunity. You can do anything here. The weather is great. It's just, it's just right. a wonderful upbringing. Man. Right. Well, that, yeah. that's certainly why I came. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I had to get the hell out of all that snow. I'm sure you did. Cold weather. Yeah. I learned New York, but I couldn't do it no more. That's right. You know what's interesting about what you just said, and, and what I sometimes when, when I have guests, they say things that are profound to me, and I just I need to isolate it sure. so that the audience can really get tap into what's really happening in the conversation. Sure. And that is this because. You know, what, what you're inviting us to understand is that in your background, success was something not only that you saw, but subconsciously probably expected. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I hate to say it like that, but that, it's, 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 it's the truth. I, I, I never, I always, I, I expected to be successful. I, I, I dreamed about it. My dreams came true. I actually, I actually dreamed about, you know, uh, having a lot of success and doing what I wanted to do and mm. traveling the world. And, you know, my mother will attest to it. I said it as a child. I want to travel the world. I want to see the world. And this business has allowed me to see the world. And a lot of times on somebody else's dime. That's the best part. Yeah. I yeah. clap for that. Yeah. That's the best part. Yeah. So let, let me ask you this, because mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, um, Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher, said that the only way to mitigate despair is with art and humor. Uh-huh. And uh, I, I have rarely talked to... Um, humorist or comedians and did not um, have a sense that their funny came from a particular place uh-huh right so so even as you've described your your background where does your funny come from <laughs> everybody in my neighborhood was funny <laughs> I mean we played the dozens we cracked on each other uh, every day. It was like you went home, you got attacked one day, and you went home and started jotting down your notes. I'm going to get him tomorrow. I'm going I'm I'm to try to find every single thing on this person that I can make somebody laugh. And then, you know, just naturally, I think growing up, I had the ability to make people laugh. And, you know, my grandmother and my aunt say, well, you need to put that boy in front of a TV. Put him on a screen somewhere. Put him on stage. And, you know, it was just something that I, I liked the reaction when people would, would laugh. And yeah. I just think that I had the ability to take real situations and find the funny. I mean, there's, mm. there's funny everywhere. Me and my sister, we laugh about this all the time, but we were at a funeral one time, and the preacher was preaching, and his teeth came out in the middle of the sermon. And I said, there's <laughs> funny everywhere. It's, all, it's just funny, man. So it's just like you know, being able to take a real situation and find the humor in it. I just feel like I don't take life that serious, man. It's just like something. funny. If you can't find the humor in the preacher's teeth coming out, come on, man. There's some, you, you, you just need to lay down and die. Yeah. Because I, I literally would have cackled like 12 yeah. hens. Oh, and he was smooth with it, too. He, he <laughs> put them right back in and just kept on going, you know? And I was like this. Now, I don't know if people are, are laughing or crying, but my aunt's sitting in front of us, and she's doing like this, and we're going, oh, she's crying. And I'm going, no. No, she's laughing. She, she's laughing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But yeah, it's, it's just, I, I think I just was always around funny people. Uh, had a very happy childhood. Mm. And I think that uh, leads to comedy because when you're happy, you know, it's like, I just don't have that stress, that, that yeah. thing, you know, I just feel like I just want to laugh. I don't want to see people laugh. I just like to see people, you know, uplifted. Was, was, was humor also how you got validation? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean, you had to have something. I wasn't an athlete. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wasn't the scholastic guy. Yeah. Uh, so it was, um, hey, make them laugh. Maybe I can get a girl's number, you know, that kind of thing. It, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> well done, sir. Yes, sir. Well, but, you know, you, 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 you talked about the neighborhood, and, and if, my, if my producers have served me well tonight, mm -hmm. um, they tell me that you went to high school with Regina King and Neil Long. Well, Regina King and Neil Long were, they were behind me. They were about uh, three years behind, so they were coming into the school as I was leaving. They were coming in as, as a freshman, as I was a senior. So did you, did you crisscross at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I so, knew, so here's my question. Here's my sure, question. Yeah. What were the three of you like in high school? Um, well, you know, I didn't know Nia very well. Okay. Um, I met her. Was she fine? Oh, absolutely. Smoking. <laughs> Smoking. But Regina and I, we actually grew up on the same block. Really? Yeah, yeah. She, we grew up on the same street. So, you know, she, she, was, she wasn't a big funny person. She was, everybody knew Regina's the professional actress that's on 227 and, and uh, shows before that, her and her sister Raina. 
And, you know, I didn't expect what we're seeing now because she's awesome right now. She what is. she's doing. She's killing the game. I mean, she's killing the game, man. Shout out to Regina And King. her sister and Raina. They're, yeah. they're killing it because they're a producing team, too. And so, but, but, you know, Nia was just, you know, part of the cute girl crew. And Regina was also a cute girl, and she, but she was uh, serious about her craft. Dedicated her and focused. No dedicated. question. Because she was on 227 then. She was on 227, and we used to laugh because the kid that, that was on 227, Curtis Baldwin, that was her, her friend and love interest on the show, when I was a little thinner and then we were much younger, people used to mistake me for him all the time. And I so can see that, actually. I didn't yeah. see it, but they used to say it all the time. That's interesting. And so we would, you know, mess around with people and say, hey, I'm... I'm I'm Curtis. I'm, the, I'm your boyfriend and all that kind of stuff, but, you know. So what were you like in high school? Um, the same as I am now. Silly. Mm. Uh, the life of the party. Mm. Um, not a good student. No, not, a, not at all. But, but very, very fun, loving. I just like to have a good time. Everything was always about a good time with me. That's the bane of my existence. You know, you know what I love about what you just said? Is I think a lot of people don't, realize that sometimes your how you are your your default setting as it relates to your personality yeah can be the very thing that life uses to give you a career and success yeah because we we try to think that of, often people think that I need to become a, a, a doctor or a basketball player but sometimes it's just tapping in and knowing who you are yeah right yeah and just putting that into what you do yeah. which is exactly what you did yeah you know, what, what, the one word I get from your life so far is consistency. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've been this way the whole time, and the difference is you found a way to take how you were and make it work for you. No question. I've had, you know, uh, one of the things that they used to say about me was that, you're so nice. He's too nice. What is too nice? I don't know what that means. He's too nice. Mm. And I would go... Look, I'm nice, but uh, I mean, don't test me because I'm only nice, <laughs> you know, as long as you don't make me angry. Right. But, and the, and the, the reason I bring that up is because I used that. I used being a nice guy to get me ahead, to get me where I wanted to be in this right. business, you know, right. to make friends, to socialize. And I think it's worked in my favor personally. But uh, I, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I. I know so. Thank you. So, 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 so tell us about, because I'm always fascinated about how people had their, their what they call their big break, their uh -huh. moment. Um, because I think all of us on some level, we're all waiting for our first big moment or another one. Mm -hmm. Walk us through how it happened for you. God guided my footsteps. So here's what happened. I mean, literally, I was just a regular summer day. I am hanging out at a park. Mm. and there's a shootout. I'm going to accelerate the story. There's a shootout going on, and me and one of my friends are hiding underneath a car, right up the street here, not too far from here. And afterwards, you know, we got out of that unscathed, and my friend said, what, man, what are we going to do in our lives, man? Hey, you ever thought about going into acting? And I said, no, no. Uh, didn't, I wasn't in theater in school or any of that kind of stuff. I was like, no, that's what they do. I don't, that's not what we do. He mm. says, no, we could do that. And I know a guy. I said, who's the guy? He said, this guy named Robert Townsend. So he says, let's go over Robert's house. I know where he lives. Are you, are you, this is a true story. No, this is a true story. This is a true story. He says, let's go over Robert Townsend. Now, at this time, this is before Hollywood Shuffle, so Robert's, we know him from uh, Soldier Story and a couple other smaller mm. roles. And so Tommy says, let's go over this guy's house. So we, you know, kids, we don't know any better. We're 19. We go to Robert's house and knock on his door. He opens the door. He's got a towel around him. That, so that just means he just got out of the shower. And he's looking at us like, yeah. <laughs> and so Tommy's like, hey, man, it's me, Tommy. Remember we met the other day? This is my friend Bentley. And we, we want to we wanna sign up for Hollywood. L literally. We're, we just thought you signed up for Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, nobody told us that you, that's not how it goes. And so, you know, we, we, uh, we hung out with him. He said, look, I got to go. But this is what I need you to do. If you're serious about this, be at my house tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, and have uh, a dozen of donuts with, with, with you. And I'll know you're serious. So I was there at 545, and I became a PA. There was no job title. It was just, yeah. hey, grab that stuff, put it in the car. We're getting ready to go shoot. I don't know what we're shooting. I don't right. know anything. We get to the first location up here in, in, uh, up in Hollywood, and... I walk on this set, and it was magical. And that gets me to the point where I started, where I said I read the script 
for the very first time. It was Robert that handed me that script. And he said, read that so you know what we're doing. Of course, you know, you're like, okay, I know what, yeah. But I didn't know what I was doing. I read the script and I was just fascinated. I said, this is, this is where I need to be. So being that it took Robert a couple of years to do this movie because of budgetary constraints, he was using his own <clears throat> credit cards, I, um, I just kind of volunteered to st stick around with him. And so I stayed on it for like two years and I got my SAG card out of that. So from that point, you know, I said, I want to be a writer. He says, you can be a writer. You can do whatever you want, but take this SAG card, utilize that as an actor, and then meet producers, get on these sets and stuff like that, and that's gonna help you get to where you wanna go. So I took his advice and I did that. Now, I started booking movie roles, TV roles, different shows, Family, uh, family Matters, Head of the Class, a, movie, a show called Gabriel's Fire at the time, just a bunch of different things. Mm. And I would meet Martin Lawrence at a audition. And we were up for the same role. I don't know how we were up for the same role. I'm six foot five. <laughs> <laughs> Mars about five eight. So I um, so we so we we um, you know we audition against each other. He gets the role, but he says we're gonna do something together one day, right? So to, to uh, fast forward up, we're driving down the street one day, going to a Clippers game, and Martin says, "Hey man, you know they want to do a, a show with me at a HBO." And I said, okay, well, what, what kind of show? He says, I don't know, a sitcom of some sort, but I'm asking you now, if you know Martin, Martin's very much like the character. He's like this, I don't want no, no BS, so whatever happens, I'm asking you now, what do you want? So, I don't, you know, so it doesn't come out later, I didn't look out for you. I said, if you want to look out for me, why don't you make me a writer? He said, but you don't write. I said, I do write. I handed him a stack of scripts the next day, and he was like, I'm blown away. Whatever I do, you got to be a part of this. Mm -hmm. Now we go over to Fox to the to the Fox lot, and he shout takes out me, to Fox. Shout out to Fox. <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, he takes me into this this meeting, and they they told him that I wasn't allowed in the meeting. And he said, Well, uh -oh. you know, uh, if he can't come in the meeting, then I don't go in the meeting, because that's that's not how we're doing this. I know my self worth, and he's a part of my team, so they allowed me to come in. Now, I need to correct you on something. I didn't create Martin. Mm -hmm. I created the Jamie Foxx show. I was a showrunner for Martin. Martin and Topper Carew actually created the show and John Bowman. Mm. But I was there from the inception of the show. Mm. And, you know, in a sense, I was a part of that creative thing. But because I didn't have the credentials at the time, they didn't give me the create, a created by credit. You were not the mother. You were the midwife. There you go. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I like that. But I was the only writer that stayed on the show from the very beginning all the way to the very end. Can I interrupt for yeah. a second and say that that has to be one of the most amazing stories that I've heard on this show. 